people are realizing that students today learn completely differently than a lot of us as instructors did even when we were coming up through college. So it seems, um, I don't know if it's overly nostalgic to try to cling to the ways that we were taught and, and think that they're the best ways to do it, but um, one of my favorite little uh, research bits I found when I'm doing some of my studies on gamification was actually a study produced by Nielsen, the, the TV ratings company. And they said that on average, while watching you know, their favorite shows, around 80% of people will check their phones or tablets or computers during the program. And when I tell that to professors, they kind of think, okay, how's that relevant? And I tell them, what that means, you realize, is that if they're watching their favorite show, something that is entirely recreational and that they're choosing to do and they like, and they're still needing to have some other interactive experience, you can't expect them to sit in a 90 minute lecture and just listen. Now that doesn't mean you need to appeal to this kind of lowest common denominator, oh hey, let's make things just fun and sacrifice academic rigor for entertainment. But it does mean that students are just simply accustomed to having an engagement opportunity every few minutes. So for them to just sit still and, and kind of passively absorb knowledge is not the best way to treat them. So if we could take that need and thirst for engagement and imply that through well thought out research pedagogy strategies in the classroom, myself advocating for game-based learning techniques, then it's win-win. The teachers get a class full of students who are paying attention, not falling asleep, or actively engaged. You don't have to worry about second devices in the, in the classroom. If people are checking their phones to participate rather than to kill time, then you don't need to worry about that as, as a negative kind of punitive element. Um, not to mention, uh, in a lot of ways, you can actually increase academic rigor and make it harder, and they enjoy it even more than if it had been you know, too easy or too boring. So in a lot of ways, if you do it right and approach it with the mindset of, I'm using this as a technique to improve the interaction with my students rather than as kind of a thin veneer of you know a spoonful of sugar to help the the learning go down then it's really going to be where you find effective teaching even doing a lot of research and trying a, a, a wide variety of things in my students i was shocked the first time i implemented this to see a handful of students still actually requesting uh, can you just give a PowerPoint lecture and have me take notes? Like, I'd, I'd, I'd prefer that. And I'm like, why? It's worse in every way. There's people falling asleep. You're not even going to pay attention. But, so for actually the older students, since I come from a higher ed background, they're so used to being molded by that kind of style of teaching that that's what they're comfortable with. And so in a lot of ways, even if you present something that is arguably objectively better, there's still going to be resistance simply because it's different. So I think between older and younger, a lot, there's a lot of more opportunity for less encumbered kind of pure reactions to the effectiveness of the style of teaching for K-12 environments. Um, but I, I really want to stress that this kind of gamification or game-based learning techniques is not something that just appeals to children. Um, it's not something that belittles you know, the subject matter that you're working on. We have law professors who are still interested in applying these techniques, not because it's fun, but because it's simply more effective. Um, if you can get results from, from a new style of, of teaching, then I think that's really what helps professors feel more confident that, that, that they're doing something right. So my first couple reactions with students, you know, there's definitely peaks and valleys. There's, there's some that say, you know, this is a waste of time, I think this is silly, da 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 da. And that's a valid complaint, and honestly, that probably says more about how I implemented it rather than the technique itself. But at the same time, I also had students that were eating it up. They were completely, participation levels were through the roof. Um, teaching a class on Photoshop is always challenging because you have some that are already very skilled and some that have never turned on a, a Macintosh before. So it's very difficult to find a lesson plan that accommodates both those types. Well, whenever I would use these gamification techniques, one of the aspects of it was kind of having these Photoshop-based puzzles. 
and the advanced students loved it. I mean, they would chew on a puzzle that I made intentionally very difficult for two weeks at a time and not give up. And they were still engaged, they had to figure it out, and they, were, you know, they wanted to prove to themselves they could do it. While at the same time, the students that were more beginners to Photoshop I opened it up so they could encourage group work and they would team up together and eventually be able to conquer these harder obstacles by helping each other out. So it just leaves a lot more flexibility in the classroom, both for reaching different learning styles, different levels of mastery, um, and different levels of what they're looking for in engagement. So I think having just another tool in a teacher's tool belt um, is always a good thing. So even if you, you don't decide that it may not be right for you um, in terms of converting your entire classroom, I definitely encourage professors to at least try, you know, try just one project or one assignment. Sometimes a, a popular element of gamification is just student agency, giving them a choice. Um, one of the things they love about games nowadays is it's not necessarily so linear where you just go from level one to two to three. You beat one or two levels and then you get a choice. Do I go down this route or do I go down that route? And you'd be shocked how dramatic that can positively impact a student's learning experience when you just give them the option. You can say, hey, do your research and then give me a presentation or do your research, write me a research paper or do your research and present with your group um, a brief you know, mini lecture on the subject. You have the extroverted students who are like, oh, I got a presentation, no, no problem. I can, I'll do the research, but I can wing it if I need to because that's what I'm comfortable in. You have the students who are more introverted that say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, there's no way I'm doing a presentation. Like If I had to do that, I'd be really stressed out, but I can do a research paper, no problem. Then they get to, essentially, you give the students the ability to demonstrate their level of mastery in a way that they're most comfortable with. So not only can they be more excited or at least less anxious about demonstrating that, but you can still have the same kind of groundwork in your rubrics. Each, pro each of the three choices can still demonstrate the same amount of mastery, but just by giving them a choice how, it's incredible. The intersection of game-based learning and online learning is, I mean, it's, it's hand in glove in a lot of ways. Um, because the types of things that, that gamification can improve, whether that's, you know, mitigating anxiety, giving student, you know, kind of agency and in, in choice over their education, um, encouraging peer learning and group work, uh, teaching soft skills like empathy, uh, role playing, leadership, teamwork, all these different things. Um, when you talk about if, if we're deconstructing how a game does this for a player and how we can apply that to a student, well, the game is already often digital. So there's a lot of correlation between how you can apply this in an online class and how you can use these principles to increase learning outcomes. I think, um, being completely biased myself, uh, one of the things I'll be talking about in my, in my speech coming up is kind of rethinking what an online course even looks like. Um, does it necessarily need to just be a series of links where you read or a series of discussion forums or a series of polls and things like that you answer? Or can it be an entire online experience that's, you know, part scavenger hunt, part, you know, IRL, you know, networking community uh, opportunities? Um, and, you know, very self-directed learning at its core. So I think kind of, again, just taking a step back, if nothing else, gamification has taught me that you don't need to take anything for granted. And it's great for any teacher, whether, you're regard whether, the, whether you are interested in the subject or not, to just kind of re-examine what you've been doing and think, am I doing this just because it's the way I've always done it? Or is there a better way out there? So it's, it's more about potential than anything else. So why is feedback so important um, for learning and for our, our continued engagement? What is it in the mind that uh, makes feedback so powerful? Um, well, there's probably not just one thing. There's probably a host of different mechanisms in the mind um, that get drawn in. When we get some kind of information back from the environment that has to do with our own performance, um, 
if we're going to remember that the the mind is set up to help us survive in an environment, that's that's really the big the big purpose. What could be more valuable than feedback to know should I keep doing the same thing or is there something else that I should do that would be more effective? Um, people do tend to be not in a bad way, but we are um, the center of our own universes, right? And so we know that self relevance is important for a wide factor, a wide range of things, including memory. So. Feedback makes it clear that, hey, this does relate to me, after all. It's a response to something that I put out there. And it has to do um, with some mechanisms specifically in motivation um, as well. So we know that people do tend to um, enter a much more engaged state of mind when they are getting frequent feedback. So if you think about things like video games, you know, why are video games so engaging? People will literally play them for days on end if, until they, they are exhausted. Well, it's not just about, you know, the story or the noises or the animation or, or this or that. A lot of it has to do with the fact that games are feedback machines. Games tell you right away and constantly, oh, here's what happens when you do this. Here's what happens when you do this. If I had to wait a week for my Halo game to tell me, hey, here's how you did, I doubt that I'd stick with that game for very long. So there's a constellation of things that make feedback really crucial.